Welcome to Dodgers Daily. I'm Casey Porter. I'm so glad that you've decided to tune in. We have a great show for you today. Today's show is all about Jacob Amaya, the young infield prospect, specifically shortstop in the Dodgers organization who is fantastic with the glove. We know that Trey Turner just recently became a free agent, so who will take that shortstop position in 2023 is the question. Today's show will make Jacob Amaya's case, but before we get into that too much, just a reminder, if you like this video and if you like this kind of content, go ahead and click that like button, leave a comment, tell all your friends about Dodgers Daily, and share this video so Dodgers Daily can keep growing and we can keep providing you content like this in the future. Okay, Jacob Amaya, what does he bring to the table for the Dodgers in 2023? Let's make his case for why he should be the shortstop for the Dodgers next year, or at least an infielder. You know, the Dodgers still have Gavin Lux, who I'm telling you, I've seen him play shortstop. He's comfortable there, but that's a whole different show. But why should Jacob Amaya start every day in the infield, or at least a lot of the days next year in 2023 for the Dodgers? Let's make that case. His lifetime fielding percentage at shortstop is 964. And believe it or not, you know, one of the big trade names is Willie Adamas. That's just two points lower than Willie Adamas's lifetime fielding percentage. I'm going to show you the range. I know one of the arguments for Adamas is the range of the arm strength. I'm going to show you the range of Jacob Amaya. I'm going to show you the arm strength. I'm going to show you how he fields the ball on the move, how he throws the ball on the move, and I think you'll be pretty impressed with it. So just two points below fielding percentage-wise, career-wise, at shortstop, of course, that's at the minor league level. Willie Adamas is at the major league level, so I know you would say that, and and you would not be wrong there. His fielding percentage, Jacob Amias, is just four points lower than Gavin Lux. It is 14 points lower than Dansby Swanson, but when you look at Swanson, he is wanting $140 million. Rumors are he's already turned down $100 million. So, that, again, we've already had a, a podcast that covers that, so today is just simply going to make – the case for Jacob Amaya. So let's get into some of his defensive mechanics. And one of the things that makes him so good is that his mechanics are just simply impeccable. He does not take a playoff. Doesn't matter if it's a routine play, a tough play. He fields the ball the same way every time. He attacks the ball great. He gets a great jump. And what you're going to see in these videos that I'm getting ready to show you is that he gets a great jump off the ball. He's very aggressive in attacking the ball to cut down his throws. And then his footwork is absolutely perfect when he's transitioning from fielding the ball into the throwing motion, and he's able to get squared up, and he throws it to his target every single time. He does not nonchalant plays. He does not do any of that kind of stuff. He gives every play the amount of respect that it deserves. He he judges his hops just terrifically so he is a very very fundamentally sound he is the kind of guy you know so many guys nowadays they would rather look pretty than look fundamental if that makes any sense and Jacob Amaya don't get me wrong he has a lot of flash to him but his flash is just the simple fact that he's very good his talent flashes and then he's very confident he has that aura to him not not arrogant or you know, not any of that, but he has a very confident aura to him that does have some flash to it. So he has flash to his game, but at the same time, he's extremely fundamental. So Jacob Amaya absolutely is the model to the fact that you can look flashy and neat and cool and all that all at the same time as looking fundamentally sound. So I want to show you that in action. This first video is Jacob Amaya, and this is a series of, uh, videos of just simple routine plays look you can see the button cap down you can see the button on the top of his hat the first baseman can the footwork watch the footwork as he transits it right there from fielding to throwing it gets him in perfect position to throw it to ryan nota now i want you to watch how soft his hands are as he brings that into his belly you see that every single one of these plays where jacob amaya has perfect love angles where he's able to feel the ball. Here's another one. Watch him feel the ball, bring it into his stomach. That makes his hands soft. And then his footwork, all at the same time, is perfectly headed towards first base. That gets him, look at his head down, footwork perfect, gets him in perfect position. So those are routine plays. I just wanted to show you, you know, I said a minute ago that he does not take plays off. He does not nonchalant anything. I wanted to show you proof of that and, and how he attacks routine plays and how fundamental he sound he is even on the routine plays. So let's talk about some of the tougher plays, moving to his left, moving to his right, and then coming straight in on his do or die balls. Moving to his left, he is one of the best defensive infielders I have ever seen. And 
And the reason is he attacks the baseball, which cuts down his throw, which means he doesn't have to throw the ball as far. And then whenever he fields the ball, somebody has taught him, I would assume, I don't know this, I don't have any inside information, but his dad or his grandpa, Frank, did play in the Dodgers minor league system in the 1950s. And his grandpa, Frank, was a famous uh, coach in the Los Angeles area. So I'd imagine his 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 uh, his grandpa, Frank, had a lot to do with how good he is. And he went to South Hills, West Covina, where they have just a tremendous baseball program. Somebody has taught him how to field a ball very, very well. And as we're going to go through these videos of him moving to his left, what I want you to notice is how he's able to field the ball. And he's able to turn his shoulders to the target, get his shoulders squared to the target, but he doesn't have to open his hips, which means if he doesn't have to open his hips and his hip stays closed, whenever he points his shoulder to that target, his shoulder is going to stay closed, and that's going to allow his arm action to go right to his target. And then what it also allows him to do, it allows him to get his arm slot in whatever position he needs to based on the position his body's in of how he fielded the ball. You're going to see just how effortlessly let's get to the first video here of Jacob Amaya moving to his left this is in and to his left see how he do or die scoops that and because he attacked that so aggressively he cut down on his throw he was able to get his feet underneath him which allowed him to make a really good throw here's a little tougher play moving all to his left and we're going to run through these again here's him coming in on the ball watch how he attacks it which allows him to square his feet which allows him to make a good throw. Watch this next one. What I want you to watch, watch him turn his shoulders squared to the target right there without having to flip his hips, which allows him to make a really, really strong throw to first base. It allows him to be more accurate. Here's that, that one again that he came in on where he attacked very aggressively. One more time, let's go through this video. To his left, deep, turn his shoulders, get a good arm angle because the shoulder turned, and make a good throw to first base. So, very, very good going to his left and transitioning specifically from fielding the ball going to his left into the throwing motion. So now let's move to going to his right. And, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of shortstops can move to their left because that's moving towards your target. It's a little bit easier play. It has a little bit less complexity to it. Moving to your right, that's a much tougher play. And, you know, that throw in the hole between shortstop and third is almost 50 yards. I don't know if you realize that or not, but but if you don't believe me, just look up some of the the pictures of the Oakland A's Coliseum when they have the football field marked out and the baseball diamond dirt at the same time. You will see that that throw from the hole between shortstop and third is almost 50 yards. So that is a very, very difficult play. And one thing you're going to notice in these videos that I'm getting ready to show you of Jacob Amaya is how well he does something called circling the ball. So what circling the ball means is if the ball's to your right, you actually go around that ball to the third base side. So when you actually field it, you can get your footwork now moving back towards first base. And you're not trying to throw a ball while still moving away from your target. So when Jacob, when he circles the ball, he's able to use his footwork to get everything square and moving back towards first base and make a strong throw. So let's get to the videos of Jacob moving to his right, and let's check it out for ourselves. Here's the first one. Look to his right. Look, I circled that ball, which allowed the footwork, allowed him to get his footwork. That's, that's Ryan Noda doing a great job at first base, but that allowed Ryan, that allowed Amaya to get his footwork underneath him, make a good throw. Here's another one. Look how he attacked that ball. He circled it, and he cut the throw down so he didn't have to throw it as far. Here's Look how he circles that ball, which allows – him to get his feet underneath him again we're going to roll through these again here's another one moving to his right again circle the ball cut down on the throw look i mean he's only a couple steps off of the grass by the time he throws that because he's so aggressive and what you'll see too as you watch this video watch how he judges the hops you know being able to be that aggressive it's one thing just to run in on the ball but you see so many young infielders that they run in the ball and are so aggressive and attack the ball so much they actually run themselves into a bad hop. Look at all the hops that he gets. He either gets a candy hop or he gets a short hop every single time, and that that is not by mistake. Here you go again. Watch him circle the ball, attack the ball. That allows him to get his feet up underneath him to make a good, strong throw. Here it is again to his right where he's able to get his feet up underneath him, make a really strong throw to Ryan Noda. So as you can see, Jacob Amaya has been taught 
how to circle those balls to his right. If you want to see him actually go into the hole and make a play, he's very good at that. I have that on my social medias as well, and it wouldn't be hard to search that and find it, but he has a very strong arm from that hole position, and a lot of it is because he's able to, again, get his footwork in a position to get underneath him and make a strong throw to first base. So let's talk about now the do-or-die plays coming straight in on the ball. And those plays are a lot tougher than you think because you're moving straight in towards home plate for one. And for two, again, you know, you're always told as a young infielder, hey, attack the ball, be aggressive, come in on the ball. And that is exactly right. But like I said just a minute ago, so many young infielders, they attack the ball so hard, they actually run themselves. They're not judging their hops as they do it, and they and they actually work themselves into a bad hop, and Jacob Amaya just never seems to do that. So let's get to the next video of Amaya coming straight in on the ball. Here it is. Here's the first one. Watch him come straight in. Field it to his left, and look again. He throws it almost from the grass, which gives him time to get his feet up underneath him, make a good throw. Look at that again. He attacked that so much that he had so much time to throw that runner out that he was able just to make an easy throw. Look at him attack that ball. Again, by attacking that ball and getting a good hop, it allows him to have a good fielding percentage. And then also by attacking the ball the way he does, it allows him to have time again to get his feet up underneath him. Look at that. And get a solid base to throw the ball to first base, which makes his throw more accurate and it makes it stronger. All of those things are just off the charts, tremendous fundamentals from Jacob Maya that he has been taught by somebody somewhere along the way. I assume those are things that the Dodgers will not have to teach him at the major league level. There will be no transition period from that. He already has superior fundamental mechanics, both moving to his left, moving to his right, and coming in. So let's go to the next part of it that I think is big for a shortstop. You know, if you're going to play shortstop, you got to have that swag. You got to have that confidence. You've got to believe that you are the best player basically ever to exist. You have to have that kind of confidence because you're going to have the most amount of plays and they're going to have a lot of pressure on them. So you have to have that, that it factor, if you will. And if you've ever seen Jacob Amaya play, or if you've ever talked to anybody who has watched Jacob Amaya play, they will tell you he has that confidence factor, he has that swag factor, he has that it factor, and I'll tell you another thing that he has. One thing that happens a lot, you know, you're not always going to feel the ball perfectly, although we've talked about Jacob Amaya doing a great job of attacking the ball but still judging his hops and giving himself either that short hop or the big hop. He does a great job of that, but what happens when he don't get that hop and things don't go perfectly, do you panic? You know, what do you do with that situation? And, you know, you drill it so many times as a coach where you work double plays and you tell your guys, hey, if you bobble the ball, if you don't field it perfectly, throw the ball to first base. Don't try to turn to if you bobble the ball. You know, and, and an old saying in coaching is the definition of a great play is any play that ends with at least one out. So, I'm going to show you a double play ball from Jacob Amaya where he doesn't make the play cleanly and watch what he does with it. Let's get that thing started right now. And I'm going to show you this ball right here. I do believe that is Marshall Kozowski on the bump right there. I'm not exactly sure though, but you're going to, yeah, that's Kozowski right there. Watch this. He bobbles and instead of trying to force the play and panicking and throwing it to Michael Bush to second, he just simply stays calm. He picks the ball back up. He throws it to Ryan Noda at first base, and he is able to get it out. And so, again, that's the situation to where how is Jacob Amaya under duress? You know, if he bobbles the ball and he's having to make real fast movements, is he going to panic and turn one mistake into two or three? He's shown time after time after time again that he can handle that situation. Just pick the ball up calmly. He knew exactly what to do with the ball, throw it to first base. Although, you know, maybe if he rushes everything and gets everything perfect, he might still get the lead runner at second base. Why take that chance? Get the one out, he did that. So he's shown, even under duress, when things don't go perfectly, he is able to stay calm and make the right play. So defensively, you know, that that's, that's his defensive game right there. We're going to move to the offensive side of the ball for Jacob Amaya. And, you know, in the past, he's shown the ability to hit for average and on-base percentage, but not power. And then last year, I say last year, actually 2021, he had 13 home runs, which was more home runs than he'd ever hit. But then the average dropped. 
Well, I'll tell you what, in 2022, he put it all together. His average was good. His OPS was good. His on-base percentage was good. And he hit 17 home runs. Now, about the only thing you could nitpick with his game is that he struck out more than he walked. And for a guy that is going to be a table setter type of guy like Jacob Amai, although if he hits 17 home runs and knocks in almost 80 RBIs, that's not exactly a table setter. That's a run producer. But for a guy like him, he considers himself to be a gap-to-gap hitter. You would think that he would be that top the lineup guy and or the eight or nine hole next year in the L.A. lineup. That's more of a table setter. Hey, get on base, get over, and then get in. That kind of player, you would like to see him walk at least as much as he strike out, uh, struck out. So he did strike out more than he walked last year, although his strikeout rate was only 23%, you know, and that would be, oh, that would be in the top, I believe, top 90 or so percent of, you know, of the, the, the all the hitters in the major leagues. That would be like the 90th fewest in the major leagues if that were the, if those were major league at bats. So that's not terrible at all, the 23%. But for a table setter, you'd like to see him walk more, I think, and get that strikeout to walk ratio to be just about even where he's walking as much as he struck out. But all the other metrics, he had 17 home runs. And check this out, his pull percentage and his oppo percentage were both exactly 36% on the year. So how about that? I mean, you talk about hitting the ball where it's pitched. You can't get any better than that whenever you look at a pull percentage and an oppo percentage that are the exact same at 36%. And then his his what they call middle percentage where he hit the ball up the middle was 28%. So for a guy that likes to be consider himself a gap to gap hitter, those are just tremendous tremendous metrics. So I'm going to show you a video of Jacob hitting the ball to all fields and doing so with power. So let's get to it. Here's the first one. He 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 gets into this one in the left center field and hits this ball a long, long ways. I do believe that is in round rock. Here's another one where he hits it to right center. See how he inside outs that ball on the inner half, which is a really good sign because that tells you with two strikes, he's going to be able to hit, you know, if you look for that outside pitch, looking to take it the other way. Even if you get an inside pitch and then there's one right down the middle that hangs that he's able to – hit to the biggest part of the field and hit a double into left center. But with two strikes, if you're looking to go the other way like that right there, and then you get an inside pitch, he's able to pull his hands in and still go opposite field with that pitch. And you always have the hustle from Jacob and Maya. And so using the biggest part of the field again, then when if you hang one towards the inner part of the plate, especially down and in, he is able to turn on that and hit that ball a long, long ways. And look how he's able to extend and get extension on that outside pitch and hit that ball over the left center field wall. So Jacob Amaya, again, 36% pull percentage, 36% oppo percentage, and he had a 28% middle percentage, which is just absolutely fantastic metrics from that perspective. So what kind of upside does he have? Check this out. Look at this picture right here. That is Mookie Betts on the top. That is Jacob Amaya on the bottom. That is the stage of the swing that I call the slot, the uh, the load where you're creating that rubber band stretch effect where you're in essence walking your hands away from your lower half and you're and you're really you're extending and getting that stretch action like that rubber band. Imagine a rubber band being stretched. The more you stretch that rubber band, the further it's going to go, the more the more inertia and power it has when you let it go, which is why guys like to create that stretch by by walking their hands back as far as they can away from their body. You can see that Jacob Amaya and Mookie Betts, they are almost identical in the way that they do that at the load stage. Here is the next stage, the what I call the elbow slot. If you look at that back elbow, it has perfectly slotted into the body. You remember Joe Morgan, he used to flap his back elbow just to remind him to do that. And then that's also right when, if you look, the barrel comes to what's called exactly zero degree slot, which means it's exactly perfectly flat or level. So if you look at the two at this position, almost exactly identical, both in the upper half, look at the head slot, look at the back leg, the back foot, look at the front leg, look at the just the angles and, and, the, and all of those types of of uh, leverages and the levers that they create. Literally, really, the only difference here is if you look at Jacob's back 
shoulder. He's a little bit later in his timing than Mookie. Mookie's a guy that likes to be a little bit earlier when he hits the ball. And Jacob's a guy we saw with the swings earlier that likes to be a little bit later because he likes to be the gap-to-gap guy. So really, I think you could say the only difference at all, which is pretty minute, is just the timing of that back shoulder from Jacob. And then if you look at the last part of the swing, right at contact, look at the head slot, identical Look at the back leg. That's a they call that a power a power L with that back heel and then that back knee. If you look, it kind of looks like an L. They call those power L's. Look at those two power L's where his foot makes that L with his ankle going up to his knee, and then where his the bottom of his leg and his knee up to the top of his leg also make an L. Look at those two power L's. Compare those between Mookie Betts and Jacob Amaya. Look how they're leveraging the front side of their body with that stiff front leg. And look at the hand position. And then look at the barrel angle, identical between Mookie Betts and Jacob Amaya. And if you drew a straight line from that left elbow all the way down through the barrel, it's an exact straight line, which means they are absolutely maximizing the amount of leverage they have in their swing, which is why Mookie Betts hit as many home runs as he did last year, which is also why I think Jacob Amaya has the potential to be a guy that continue to hit home runs like he did last year. He hit 17, and this is why. The, the leveraging that you just saw in that picture is almost identical to Mookie Betts, and Mookie Betts is a guy that we know that, um, that can hit a lot of home runs. So projection-wise for Jacob Amaya – Is he going to be the shortstop for 2023? Nobody knows that question. But I can tell you this, with the mechanics that he uses, with the confidence and swag that he plays with, with the offensive game that is growing for him, you know, he he, like I said, he makes even the most routine plays with the most amount of respect, with the greatest of, of mechanics and mechanical movements. He doesn't take plays off. He does not nonchalant anything. I think he's very much so major league ready right now, and and I think in, in quick time it's very possible that he could be a top-shelf major league defensive player in a very quick amount of time offensively. So let's go through some of the metrics that maybe the Dodgers will be looking for with Jacob Amaya. You know, at, probably if he was to play with L.A. next year, at least at the beginning, he'd probably be put him – at the back of your lineup, maybe eight hole, maybe nine hole. So what are some of the metrics you might want to see him try to hit? Okay, so let's say that he hits 250. Let's say that he has a strikeout rate around 20% and his walks to strikeouts are fairly similar with each other. And then he has an on-base percentage between, say, 350 and 375. He hit maybe seven to 10 home runs and he had 50 to 75 RBIs and then played the great defense. Would you take that as a shortstop, knowing that you're getting him on a very, very, very bargain bargain basement type price? Would you take that production? Okay, again, I'm going to go over that again. You have about a 250 average. You have a K percentage around 20%. Your, your walk to strikeout ratio is very similar. You, you, you walk almost as much as you strike out. Your on-base percentage is between 350, 375. You hit anywhere from 7 to 10, maybe 12 to 15 home runs, somewhere in there, and you have 50 to 75 RBIs. If that's the offensive player you get from Jacob Amaya next year, combined with his defense, that is really, really good. And here's the good news, Dodgers fans. He either reached all those benchmarks or passed all those benchmarks or was almost right there, right at those benchmarks. So those are all bit why did I put those benchmarks down? Why did I why am I saying them now? Because those are all benchmarks that he's either reached or passed or it's really close to reaching, which means he's totally capable of doing that. Again, it's at the minor league level, but that's the only level he's had to prove himself with. So would you take those numbers? He's proven that he can give those offensive numbers. He's proven he can do that. He's proven he can put all of those things together and reach all those benchmarks as an offensive player. So would you take that? I'm glad that you tuned in to our latest edition of Dodgers Daily. Today is all about Jacob Amaya and making his case why he should be a regular starter in the Los Angeles lineup next year defensively in the infield. And I hope that you tune in to our next edition of Dodgers Daily. I also hope that you visit DodgersDaily.net. That's DodgersDaily.net. And I also hope that you visit Dodgers Daily on all the social media platforms, 
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. And I also hope you become a subscriber to our Dodgers Daily Podcast. Hey, also, go over to Dodgers Prospects Podcast on YouTube and check that one out. Tim Rogers of Dodgers 2080 and I, uh, Casey Porter of Dodgers Daily, obviously. We have a joint venture. We have started back up the Dodgers Prospect Podcast. We talk all about the Dodgers Prospects. Tim just does a wonderful job. He gets to talk to all the guys at Rancho keeps up with the prospects and so we have good conversation every week we really enjoy bringing you that show so again go over to the youtube dodgers prospects podcast page check that out give us a like give us a comment tell us what you think so we can know the kind of content that you want in the future when we drop our next episode so okay again i want to give you one more reminder if you like this video and if you like this kind of content go ahead and click that like button leave a comment tell all your friends about dodgers daily and go ahead and share that video so dodgers daily can keep growing because that really helps us and we can keep providing you content like this in the future as always thanks for tuning in and go dodgers